943. Oh, get over here to, there we go, get into fourth. Okay. All right. So we are recording. Okay. So first the study guide 12, one and two is the one I just told you about. It is already graded. And if you need to see exactly where I took the points off, you should be able to see the little sticky notes that went over exactly where the points were taken off. If you missed any points, the gray box was due this past Friday. I'm hoping to grade it uh, sometime today or this evening. The notes for nuclear are due tomorrow. Remember that you have, um, 50% of the grade is the blanks, 25% of the grade is the signatures, and 25% of the grade is the embedded questions. All right, so that's the notes they're due Tuesday. The, um, the study guide for nuclear is due on Wednesday, the test for nuclear is Wednesday, and the vocabulary test is Thursday. Um, here in this week um, on Schoology, I have, um, Today I've got today's um, discussion day. I'll put um, when I finish this recording, it'll be in here. I have um, the information of the test dates. Um, the nuclear test will be a quiz is test and the vocabulary test is a test in Schoology. OK, and this is a link to those flashcards I was telling you about. I gave you a link last week. Here's a fresh link this week. OK, those flashcards that I'll be using. It's the same. It's the same link, but I, I posted it again for you uh, for um, the flashcards. All right, do you guys have any questions about the due dates before we start taking our, um, our doing our lesson? I'll print screen. Any questions? All right, so let's put this in here with the time. 9.46. Paste. Save. Minimize and get this a little smaller so I can sort of see y'all, but I still can see the PowerPoint. Okay, the PowerPoint can be a little smaller, I think. I can see most of y'all. Let me slide this over here. Okay, so nuclear. All right. So what we're going to be learning with our nuclear is um, it's like we understand how nuclear fission reaction works and we're going to describe the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using nuclear and then we're going to talk about the future of nuclear um, where we get into thorium reactions and salt uh, reactions in nuclear and also nuclear fusion, which is um, very promising if we can make it happen. All right. So um, there. The question at top says the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear power. There's almost no advantage. Almost no advantage. I'm going to go over the specifics as we go through, but nuclear power has a very low environmental impact, but it also has an extremely low net energy, high cost um, to get that thing built. We'll talk about how to get a reactor built. Fear of accidents, long lived nuclear radio waste. That stuff is so frightening. And the role of uh, spreading nuclear weapons technology. The the stuff we're doing with nuclear is giving the terrorists and saboteurs just fuel for whatever they need to do. Like fossil fuels, the nuclear power falls under the category of non-renewables because this uranium-235, we are digging it up out of the earth. That's a mineral, so it's not renewable. Once we've dug it all up, there won't be any more. Um, the Earth's three leading producers is United States, France, and Russia. We knew U.S. and Russia. We don't hardly hear anything about France, but they are one of the leading producers of nuclear. Um, inside both nuclear and fossil plants, the whole thing is, is to boil water to make the power plants. We talked about this the other day. The entire reason where we have the, the way that power plants work is using steam to spin a turbine. So the whole point to have a power plant is to boil water. Okay. Nuclear power plants, the same thing. The crazy, frightening, scary stuff about nuclear that you're le learning about, the entire frightening, scary whole concept is just to boil water. Just to boil water. OK, so um, the nuclear production involves a little bit it's more, a little more complex and costly than it would be to make a coal plant, a lot more complex and costly. Um, a controlled nuclear fission reaction is carried out to provide the heat 
the nuclear fission reaction is what's making the heat to boil the water. And this is a nuclear fission reaction. OK, remember we said there's two kinds, fission and fusion. OK, so um, fission means split. The word fission means to split. Fusion means put together. We'll talk about nuclear fusion at the end. Fission means split. All right, so the way it works is you guys can see my mouse, right? You take this big uranium atom. Now, this is not the whole atom. This is just the nucleus of the atom. OK, so there's a floating around the outside here. You have electrons and stuff like you would for any atom. So the electrons are floating around the outside. We're talking about here within the nucleus. They take a neutron, shoot it in the nucleus of the uranium, and it splits it into two pieces. When it splits it into two pieces, um, again, both of these new pieces are still radioactive. But the process of, of breaking them apart like this gives a whole chunk of energy and three new neutrons, which in turn can be used to split another atom. Then you split it, give off a chunk of energy and three new neutrons, and you split it again, chunk of energy, three new neutrons, it's a chain reaction. Every one of these three neutrons will go split another uranium atom. Okay, it starts a chain reaction. So the whole process takes place inside the reactor of a power plant. All right, and uh, so this is the heat that we use to generate the electricity to boil the water, and this is how the plants are set up. All right, so you have this big case here, this big concrete and steel and lead case that's designed to keep everything in, this big gray thing here. This is where the fuel actually is, okay? And um, you have water that is, there's two separate circuits of water, okay? You have this one here, see this coil? This only goes to the fuel and back again. This is a single coil right here. This is a circuit. There's a secondary circuit here, okay, that the water goes around here and it will also go out into the rest of the world. They say that this water is clean because it never actually came in contact with the fuel. You see, that's this other one. This other one circles here. Okay, this one comes in contact with the fuel. This is the one that when this comes through, this steam here is what uses the turbine, but they say it never comes in contact with the fuel, but you know that this stuff has got to be nasty, dirty water too, full of radioactivity, just coming in that close of a contact and they're putting it out here in the world. Um, it's produced by light fission reactors. We take this uranium core um, after the fuel, after the uranium fuel is mined, it's enriched to increase the concentration to about 5%. So they enrich this, the enriching of the fuel is one of the parts that where the terrorists can get hold of it when while they're enriching the fuel. Let's see, that's Perry and it's 951. Okay. Now every uranium, the uranium is processed into small pellets that are about the size of a pencil. And then they stack up these little pellets and they put them together in what they call fuel rods. So they process the uranium down into the size of a pellet and the, they stack the pellets up in fuel rods. And then they have what they call control rods. Let me get back to my screen so it'll switch screen. They have control rods that will raise up in and out. So the fuel rods are here. Control rods will go in. That's where the neutrons come from, where they're shooting the neutrons from. So the control rods, when they raise the control rods out of the fuel, then the reaction slows down and the temperature should, should go down because this is like ridiculous hot. Then they put the control rods back in and then the reaction starts up again and it gets hot again. So they use the control rods moving in and out of the fuel to uh, manage the, the temperature. OK, it speeds up or slows down the reaction. And then they use this coolant, the fresh waters, to circulate through the core. OK, that's supposed to prevent the other components from melting down and releasing the waves. So this secondary thing of water is supposed to keep everything else cool All right, to keep it from melting down. And this meltdown is what causes the accidents. Something happens to the coolant water. The containment shell, again, is made of really thick steel reinforced concrete and a lead also designed to keep the radioactive materials from escaping into the environment if there is an in internal explosion and it's supposed to protect the core from external threats like weather and disasters 
So uh, the need of all of these safety features means that building a nuclear power plant costs $10 billion or more, and it takes 10 years to make it happen. OK, so it takes $10 billion or more to make all this stuff. And so most of the space in the power plant is taken up by equipment that is designed to cool down the reaction to keep everything from going crazy. The plant is located near water because they're using the water to do most of the cooling and the waste that escapes naturally from the plant doesn't appear to be harmful. OK, the, the wastewater doesn't appear to be harmful because the two waters never touch each other. Well, it only appears so because, you know, accidents happen. Would you feel comfortable living near a power plant or not? Me? Heck no. Absolutely. Heck no. All right. The nuclear fuel cycle go goes from everywhere from digging it out of the ground to processing it to burning it. And then what the heck are we going to do with it afterwards? So every that every part of the, the fuel cycle has to be considered, not just when we're burning it at the plant. But building and running the nuclear plant is only one part. The cycle includes the mining and the processing, using it, and then safely storing it afterwards. So there's two different processes. Um, one involves the um, one process means we use it once and we put it in the ground. The other process involves reprocessing the fuel. And right, we're going to talk about that in just a few more minutes about reprocessing the fuel. United States used to do that and we don't anymore because it's in the reprocessing steps that we've started to lose a lot to nuclear terrorists. So using the nuclear power has some has some advantages, but more disadvantages and challenges. As long as the operate the reactor is operating safely, when it's working correctly, there's very little environmental impact and little risk of accident, and it doesn't actually put off much carbon dioxide during the process while it's reacting. But if you consider the entire fuel cycle, the entire process from building to running to storing that whole thing, it, the net energy and the environmental impacts are ridiculous. OK, the net energy is really almost low down to nothing. OK, if you consider the whole thing, because those who support nuclear power claim that while it's running, you have a very little carbon dioxide being emitted, little to no carbon dioxide while that thing is running. OK, but that's only partially correct because that took 10 years to build this plant in that whole 10 years of time you have Remember we talked about steel and concrete. OK, the amount of coal it takes to melt the metal to make steel, the whatever it does to take concrete, all of that stuff is incredibly. And then the trucks driving everything back and forth everywhere they need to go. The amount of carbon dioxide in building that 10 years worth of building it is significant. It's huge. It is way more than it would take to make a coal plant way way more than it would take to make a coal plant and then every other step within the cycle is also going to release carbon dioxide you uh and then the emissions may be lower than the coal plants while they're running but you still have some and this still is going to affect the the whole the whole emissions the, through the whole fuel cycle um Power plants don't emit the air pollutants while they're operating if they're operating without any problems. And the modern plants can perform with little risk, but many of the nuclear reactors in the United States are aging. Do you see this? Where that coolant water is pouring out of a bolt that has rusted? Do you see this, all this rust here? This, the average age of nuclear power plants in the United States is 34 years, but then you have to note our book was written in 2015, so you need to add at least five years to this. So we're looking at 39 years old and worldwide it's 25, knock that up to 30. The plants are only licensed to operate safely for 40 years. They're only given a license that lasts them 40 years and most of ours are 39. They're only guaranteed to operate safely for 40 years, and most of ours are older than that by now, or that old or older. Now, they can request a 20-year extension from the government, and most of them have, but that doesn't make it new again. <coughs> if they were told at the beginning that you can only work well and safely for 40 years, and then you get a 20-year extension from the government, does that automatically make you safe? Does that turn the clock back? Does that get rid of the rust and degradation? No, you just got a piece of paper from the government saying they don't care. And they don't. 
they extended that 20 year purpose knowing that these power plants are on their last leg. And so the uranium within the fuel rod itself only lasts about three to four years. OK, before it, it's spent, they say it's spent. That means it's useless and it has to be replaced. These spent rods are way too hot and way too active radioactive to throw away, obviously, you know this. And researchers have found that even if you take one of these spent fuel rods, 10 years after you take it out of the machine, you remove it from the reactor, one single fuel rod can still kill a person who is three feet away in three minutes. I'm not talking give him cancer and he'll die in 10 years. I'm talking instantly kill him in three minutes. And that thing's already been out of the machine for 10 years. It's been out of the machine for 10 years and that dude is dead in three minutes. It's that dangerous. And he didn't get up right on it. He didn't touch it. He was still three feet away from it. And I would hate to find out how, how I would hate to know how they came up with these numbers. Did they actually test this? Did this actually happen to somebody? God, I hope not. But I believe it did. That's how they would know. I believe this happened to somebody. And that's how they came up with the numbers. That's how they found out their data. But here's what happens if you come in contact with the radioactive waste. The human exposure, even at low levels, is going to cause cancer without it. It's not questionable cancer. It is, yes, you'll have cancer, even at low levels. Um, but the high doses are going to cause immediate death or delayed radiation sickness. And the symptoms of radiation sickness include weakness, burns, reduced organ function because your insides are melting, um, nausea, hair loss. So if you've ever seen one of the uh, um, post-apocalyptic movies, you've probably seen some of this stuff. All right, so these spent fuel rods, when they when the fuel is run out, they have to be stored safely for 10,000 to 240,000 years. Now, those two different numbers come up with uh, whether you reprocess it or not. If you reprocess it, um, that cuts the number down to two to 10,000. Without reprocessing, it's 240,000 years. And I'm going to talk about the two two options in a second. But after the removal, they're stored in these water filled pools for several years, okay, in order for them to cool down enough because they're still crazy hot. I mean, you talk about, you know, when you first bring a take a pot out of the oven and it takes it five minutes or 10 minutes to cool down. This takes years, years and years to cool down in this pool. Once it's cooled down, they can go to this dry cask storage. You see my pictures up here. Cask is another word for barrel. OK, cask is another word for a barrel. OK, so they put this in dry cask storage and they got 20 years. So between the three to five years in the pool and then 20 years in the cask. All right, but this stuff has to be stored for 10,000 years at the minimum, 240,000 for the maximum. This 20 years in the pool and then the cask is not enough. The security at the, safe, the storage sites is also a concern. One study warned that the waste storage pools and the dry cask at two thirds of the US plants are vulnerable to sabotage or terrorist attack. Two thirds of the United States nuclear plants are basically open door for terrorists. All it would take is somebody to knock down a couple of those barrels and just put them out in the world and then everybody who lives there is dying. Terrorists. Two thirds of the, the US nuclear power plants are vulnerable to terrorist attacks. Not just one or two with lazy, lazy people working them, but two thirds of them. OK, so th now this is the thing that, that gets us the difference in the years reprocessing. You can do reprocessing, but it's extremely expensive. Um, it removes the, the radioactive plutonium. And the thing about that to remove the plutonium is exactly what the bomb makers are looking for. So all it takes is, you know, knocking off one reprocessing plant and you've got enough plutonium for bombs. OK, the, the reprocessing will reduce the storage time from 240 to 10,000 years. OK, so but still 10,000 years is incredible. The modern humans only evolved 200,000 years ago. Think about when we're trying to think of time spans here. If you go from caveman to computer. Think about human evolution, caveman to computer. That's 200,000 years. This stuff has to be stored for 240,000 years. What would happen to the human evolution in that time? Will we still be cognizant? What, what will have happened for evolution? Will we still know that we need to worry about this stuff? Will we still have enough society? Will we still have enough 
history that we know that we're supposed to be warning this or we'll have the society developed devolved into like farmers and nothing else and we don't know any of our history there's no telling what could happen in that 240,000 years the united states spent billions and billions of dollars on this reprocessing thing to cut it down in the seven in the when they first got started from the 50s to the 70s but they abandoned it in the 70s because there were so many incidents of people trying to steal it so now we just dig it up out of the ground and use it new, dig it up out of the ground, use it new, dig it up out of the ground, use it new, which means when we store it, it's that 240,000 year span. They don't even do the reprocessing anymore. So what we have to do once we once they've been in those dry casks long enough, the barrels, then they have to go underground. OK, deep burial. Now, the problem with deep burial is you have to find a place here that will never, ever, ever, ever have earthquakes not even little ones, never, ever, ever have earthquakes. And so to find a suitable storage place alone for that is difficult, not to mention how much it costs to build it. And even so, we've been doing nuclear for over 60 years. Even after 60 years of research, we're still not sure if that's good enough. We still don't know what's gonna happen. Think about, it. we've been working on this for 60 years. But we, we, it's something we know we're going to have to keep up with for 100,000. So what we've done so far is we don't, we don't have a good accepted way to save it. So with the research is continuing. We're still trying to do the research to figure out the safest way to do this. But as we are doing it, it's still building up. We're doing a little research, trying to figure out more and trying to figure out more. It's still building up daily. And so about 78% of the nuclear waste in the U.S. is stored in the pools right now. About 22% is stored in the dry cask. And that only is going to cover 100 years at the very most. It, what, we, what we're doing right now is only covering about 100 years. We don't have long-term stuff, acceptable plants. And again, the modern plants are going to produce that, like once they're running, the modern plants will perform without little risk, but many of the ones in the United States are aging. And we know that we just said earlier, all of the average age in the US for the power plants is 39 years. They're allowed to work for 40 and then they can get an extension, which they have. But over half the world nuclear reactors operating worldwide are going to have to be decommissioned by 2025. What year is it? 2021. These have to be decommissioned. OK, decommission the new nuclear reactors cannot be built fast enough to replace these aging, so it's not even worth it. So there's three possible ways to decommission a power plant. That means shut it down when you're done with it. First, you could dismantle the whole plant and safely store all the radioactivity active materials, which of course we can't store the radioactive materials. We don't know how. Then you can close the plant behind a physical barrier with full time security until the good storage facility can be figured out and built. But think about that full time security. You're going to have to have people guarding an empty nuclear plant. An empty nuclear plant is going to be boring most days in and out. All right, but you still have to guard it. All right, now here's the thing. What happens if one or, one or two of those security guards, they all of a sudden have some um, unexpected medical bills in their family and they, because they're security guards, you're not going to pay them very much. They're not going to be paid very much. What if they had some sort of awful thing happened in their family and they have to have a big medical bill and then some terrorists come knocking on the door? I can help you pay your medical bills. Leave the gate unlocked. Can you imagine how tempting that would be? You have to have security behind these closed facilities for hundreds of thousands of years. The security, the, the plant is decommissioned. It's sitting there an empty building and you still have to have security full time. Can you imagine how easy it would be for terrorists to get up in under that? You could possibly, like this picture up here, enclose the plant in a concrete and steel tomb, but who wants that? And again, it has to be someplace where there's never an earthquake. That, that when that concrete, if you've ever had like, like the back porch, like our back porch, the concrete is so old because our house was built in the 70s, the concrete is starting to break down on our back porch. This has to be stored safely for hundreds of thousands of years. That concrete's going to break down. Who's going to pay for it to get it refreshed and recovered? We are. 
otherwise it won't get done, which means all of that nuclear waste is going to get out in the environment. So regardless of whichever one of these methods is chosen, the high cost of retiring plant is going to add to the enormous cost of the nuclear fuel cycle. And it already has a very low net energy to begin with. You consider how much it costs to build it, how much it costs to decommission it. There is no way that the net energy on these nuclear plants is worth the, the trouble. Even if every one of the nuclear power plants was shut down tomorrow, these high-level radioactive wastes were going to complete need to be set, stored safely for thousands of years still. It's not going to go away. And the main thing that causes accidents is the loss of the coolant water. Remember I said that you saw those two circles of water? Without the cooling water, the core of the reactor is going to melt down and explosions will release radioactivity in the environment. So between 1952 and 2015, when this book was written, there were 34 serious nuclear incidents or accidents. The three main big ones were Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima in Japan. And within every one of those, there was loss of life some more than others, but every single one of them had to evacuate huge portions of the cities around them. There was huge evacuations happening place with these. And Chernobyl, um, it was so bad that they weren't allowed to return. And so they are taking day turn that Chernobyl, I want to say is in the 80s. Um, they're allowed, the, enough of this stuff has cleared up that they can have day trips. They can't spend overnight, but they can have day trips in. Now, this dude is wearing this mask just for show. Okay, they've made it, they've, it's, the radioactivity has decreased to levels where you don't need mask like that. He's just doing it for the picture. But um, when they had to evacuate the people and nobody was allowed to come back, there's like, everybody had to just leave it. There's like, baby dolls and cribs where they're just like empty or, or di dinner tables where the plates were still out. Um, and the thing about it is, is they evacuated the people. They didn't evacuate the animals. So there's huge studies of the, there's like one of the links on your webpage is the wolves of Chernobyl. The animals who had to stay, they've been studying them all of these years. The animals who were living in all that radioactivity. All right, it's really, really interesting. And so there's a film on our web page about the wolves of Chernobyl, if, it, if the link is still good. Most of the links aren't working really well. Okay, these are some more of those questions that we have for you. These two video links are news reports. The, the big nuclear incident that happened here in the U.S. was Three Mile Island near New Jersey. And um, so these two video reports are the announcers at the time. So this is 70s, so it's fun to look at all the retro. But at the time when this was happening and so we want to think about if you saw this report on television what would you have thought or if you live near three mile island what would you what would you be thinking about at this time after the three mile island is closed down now um but not all of these these, these other ones here this one of the questions we ask is are they all cut down these three they're not some of them are still working okay i think this uh, fukushima is still working but they don't automatically shut them down after there's been an accident all right now What's weird though, art imitates life. At the exact same time or about the same time Three Mile Island was blowing up, there was a movie out called China Syndrome. And it's not like Three Mile Island blew up and this is, oh, let's make a movie about this. No, they were out at the same time. It, the coincidence is chilling that this movie was out and Three Mile Island blew up at the same time. So I could, last year we were able to find the whole movie, but the, the, the Movies are really hard to get anymore if you don't pay for them. And so I have the trailer and you can still see enough from the trailer to get the idea of what the movie was about. And so you can do that. And it's just if you can find it, it's really interesting, especially if this is something that interests you. But you can use the trailer to be able to answer these questions about the movie. But the thing about it is, is that it the movie was coming out at the same time Three Mile Island was blowing up. So the, the whole atmosphere around nuclear power, I'm sure, had everybody just frightened to death. So those people, the, there's advantages and disadvantages. The people who say nuclear power is a good thing, um, what they'll tell you is that uh, there's no carbon dioxide emission during emissions during plant operations. While the plant is running, there's not carbon dioxide emitted. They're, they are researching potential cheaper and safer reactors. Now, it's not in the notes, but in your book, it talked about thorium and it talked about salt reactors as possible alternatives. Okay, thorium and salt reactors. So you'll want to check into that. It's in your book. Um, so the 
the, re the possible cheaper and safer reactors, developing nuclear fusion, which is at the end of this section. I'm going to try to get to today if we have time. 13, I think we'll have time. All right. Eh, maybe not. I don't know. All right. But then they're, they're going to have to continue the subsidies. And that's the thing that they, I don't know why that's an advantage. Continuing the subsidies is no kind of way advantage if I've got to pay for it. The opponents of nuclear power say the risk of accidents is, is you just can't avoid that. The damage to the environment and the nuclear weapons, there's no, those three things are too much to go over it. So the subsidies are still continuing. The government is still paying for this nuclear. The government has provided large research and development subsidies, tax breaks, loan guarantees to the nuclear industry for more than 50 years. I figure somebody would have said, OK, that's enough. You're not doing what you said you'd be doing. I'm not giving you any more money. But they've been doing it for more than 50 years. It's the government has assumed almost all of the financial burden of developing ways to store the waste. Even the companies themselves, they're not even worried about how to store the waste because they figure the government's going to figure it out for them. They're not even trying to store the waste. The government will figure it out, which means we will pay for it. In addition, the government has provided accident insurance guarantees. All right, so think about when you have accident insurance on your car. Okay, say you have an accident in the car. The insurance is designed to help cover the costs uh, either to you or to the other person to kind of help with the cost, right? That's what accident insurance is for. Regular insurance companies will not give insurance to the nuclear plant, so the government gives it to them. The government is providing accident insurance, which means we will pay for it if there's an accident. Not the company themselves. We have to pay for it because the government has provided the accident insurance for them. So since 1948, the government has spent over $95 billion on nuclear energy research and development. That's four times the amount that was spent on research and development of every type of good energy altogether. If we would spend that much money on solar and wind and water, we would have it already. We would have it already and we wouldn't have to worry about this stuff. But the government wants to spend it on nuclear. OK, so many people are questioning the need for continued taxpayer support with nuclear power, especially since the energy output's not increasing. You're not living up to what you told us you'd be able to do. In fact, you're giving us a big headache and the safety concerns. All right. Because the serious concerns related to commercial nuclear is the spread of nuclear weapons technology. In the international marketplace, the United States and eight other countries sell. We sell commercial and experimental nuclear reactors. We sell uranium enrichment and we sell purification technologies. And we pretty much don't care who we sell it to. All of this information and this equipment can be used to produce bomb grade uranium and plutonium for nuclear weapons. And we sold them the stuff so that they could do it. That in itself is enough to say, nah, nah. So the people who are responsible, the people who are, who care about what's going on, they have five things that they want to tell the government. Of course, the government just laughs at us. Five things, five criteria that have to be met. First, the reactors should be built so that the runaway chain reaction is impossible. Remember, I said the neutrons hitting the other neutrons hitting the other neutrons. That's what causes meltdowns. OK, second, the fuel used in the reactors and method of fuel enrichment must not lend itself to production of nuclear weapons. Don't you build bombs with this stuff and don't and fix it so that they can't fix it so that it's impossible. Number three, the spent fuel and dismantled structures must be easy to dispose of without burdening our generations, our grandchildren and great grandchildren having to deal with the mess we've made. Number four, the whole fuel cycle has to, to, to generate net energy high enough to eliminate the need for subsidies. If you can make the energy on your own and you don't need subsidies, well, then we'll talk about it. But if you still need subsidies, uh, -uh not happening. And number five, the whole cycle has to generate less greenhouse gases than every other alternative. OK, the only way that I'll let you keep doing this nuclear mess is if you make less emissions than everybody else and if even one person beats you you don't win you don't win so nuclear fusion is the option that we they're talking about remember fission is splitting the atoms fusion is putting them together the things you're putting together this deuterium and tritium this picture right here those are hydrogen sorry i was about to say helium those are two hydrogens those are hydrogen nuclei the two different types of hydrogen 
You take those two types of hydrogen, squish them together, you make helium plus an extra neutron. So those are two different types of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, two, two types of hydrogen. Squish them together and make a helium. And you get a ton of energy. None of that stuff is dangerous. Helium, so we maybe we'll talk like this, like we inhaled a helium balloon if there's a leak, but that's all. I mean, this is nothing dangerous with this, if we can get it done. Now, the trouble is, it is very, very difficult to create the reaction that will take the two hydrogens and smash them together. It takes a lot of energy to make the two hydrogens smash together to make a helium. But we could use it to destroy this toxic waste that we've created. We could use it to supply electricity for desalinating water. We could use it to help use hydrogen fuel as a clean burning energy source. After 50 years of research and 225 now, just 25 now, nuclear got 95. This has only gotten 25 billion. Okay. Uh, the human the fusion reaction is still in its infancy now again this book is five years old we've made some advancements in the five years that there is some possibility here but none of the tested approaches have been able to produce more energy than they used up remember that's the whole part of net energy you have to make more energy than it took right so we haven't been able to do that yet um but in 20, 2006, U.S., China, Russia, Japan, South Korea, India, a whole bunch of nations got together, invested $12.8 billion in a joint effort for a log. Oh, time to go. All right. So you'll have to read this on your own. All right. Let me pause the, the video. All right. Stop the recording. All right.